Thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Very happy to be here. So first of all, we'll dispense with this quickly. Why not a coma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then she can't wear that pretty dress that she was wearing. Oh, I see what a you're saying. I took the wrong coma. coma. I went to the wrong person. That she wakes up in a year and yeah. everything's changed and she has to fight her way back into the family. I, I think the show did that already or something like that. We did do that. <laughs> That's season two. All right. But it was nice to see that you all, even after Connie, our St. Raina, uh, left the show, that you brought her back in flashbacks and things like that. And I'm guessing that the door is open if at some point down the road you needed that kind of appearance again. I talked to Connie Britton the other day, sure. by the way, yeah. and she said she what was open she to it. Sure. So. <laughs> so are you all open to then it? Yes. <laughs> I think, you know, whether she's in the episode or not, you're going to feel her presence throughout the whole second half of the season and yes. probably beyond in a lot of ways. And what I thought was interesting, and I, I feel like this is going to be sacrilegious now, but the two episodes directly after her death were some of the best acting that the cast on the show has ever done. Especially and the girls. And it's a great cast. I mean, were so they were so impressive. It and was, I'm sure part of that was because they were actually <laughs> missing Connie, too. But it seems like Raina's death actually might give you an opportunity to breathe fresh life into the show, as terrible as that might sound. Definitely, especially with uh, Deacon and the girls. You know, Deacon learning to, to raise these girls and the girls learning to get along um, without their mother. Yeah, yeah. he missed, um, you know, so many years of being a father and now he's being yeah. thrust into that role in a way that he would never really had a lot of experience with. So it's a big challenge for him that will play during this half of the season. And, but, you know, her, she touched every one of the characters' stories and storylines and I think you'll see ripples and reverberations in interesting ways with each of them. And you know, the way grief works, you might see you know, some people processing it immediately, some people it coming back to much later, and uh, sort of seeing how that plays out in all the storylines. And poor air close, poor Teddy. So when he gets out of jail, is there any chance that there's gonna be a return of that threat of Teddy? Because I mean, Daphne actually is his daughter, which he, you know, keeps pointing out, and he raised Maddie, so is there a possibility that Teddy looms on the horizon? S assuming he's available and the story <laughs> determines it. Uh, uh, he, uh, I mean, I think that's what made episode, one of the great things about episode 10 is, you know, there wasn't a, these dilemmas in which there aren't clear answers, and these, this was a real problem and a real issue where you could see different sides to it in a way and Deacon had stepped up in a beautiful way to raise these girls but it's not as if Teddy didn't have a legitimate claim to um, you know seeing being their guardian you know being a part of the company and everything moving forward so I think that's part of what made that plot so so good and so we saw Damien come back and so we know who the father of Scarlett's child is and for a split second, I'm sure I was not the only one who thought, oh, they're gonna do a thing, like Raina didn't tell Deacon about Maddie, and now Scarlett's not gonna tell Damien about this baby, but you decided to go a different way, which I think is wise, but was that on the table, that sort of parallel idea? Not, not so much the hiding, uh, no, I think we always knew that um, they would share this, and that you kind of hint forward that they are gonna maybe hope to try to make this work, and we'll see where that goes. With the two dads. And yeah, without giving too much away, I think we um, saw some fun, awkward um, humor and tension in the idea of the three of them trying to work this yeah. out <laughs> together with it in the open. Uh, one thing that I think has been great since Raina's death, I keep feeling bad that I'm happy about some things since Raina died. <laughs> That's <laughs> but okay. I am. Um, that I feel like music and I know that you all know this is something that people have been talking about, that music has come back into the show in a way where the songs really are commenting on the action in a way that sometimes the setting doesn't necessarily allow that, but it seems like you're working really hard in the last five, six episodes to really have the songs that you've chosen to really be part of the story. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yes. <laughs> you've done that, but is that and something that, that's a, that you've That's heard? a real, that's a pretty involved process. Uh, a lot of songs get listened to, and it's a lot of discussion, a lot of, passionate uh, uh, argument for your yeah. favorite, you know, and uh, y yeah, it's a big part of the show. And I think it's, it's a beauty of uh, working on a, a music show is the, you know, telling story through song is, is uh, 
something that you don't normally get to do, obviously, on a non-music show. So, and the different ways that can happen is always a challenge and always really interesting. We always take that into consideration whenever we, you know, are talking music stories. And here's uh, on my way. You know, that was 503. So 10 episodes later, it shows up in a different kind of way, different track, different setting. And it played over a long montage in 503 with all these, this, wow, this, this lyric applies to four or five different scenarios. Yeah, the way and, that... And now it applies to Juliet in a whole different way, and then you see the Bucky and the whole thing, so yeah. And the way that that was orchestrated, I mean, by Tim, I mean, you know, it's, you took one thing and turned it into this whole other beautiful thing with this chorus and uh, everything else. I think, I think we, one of the things we wanted to play with this season was, you know, the way that artists develop a song, and you will hear it multiple times and in different contexts and with a hit single, and hopefully you'll get to hear things and, as you said, feel differently about them in different contexts. I, I also think, yeah, there's two ways we can play music on the show. One is there are stories happening and occasionally the characters take breaks to perform. And right. the other is that they're much more woven into the storylines. And I think, you know, as much as we could make it a show, not just about the lives of country musicians, but about the creative process um, and how that interweaves with their lives um, was something we were really striving for. And it seems to me that when you're picking these songs then, because you're going out to the songwriting community, that you have to know fairly far in advance since you want to weave these into the Not story. Not as far as you might think. <laughs> yeah. Not as far as Tim I would mean, like them in advance. it's, okay, so I have a band booked for tomorrow. This shoots the day after tomorrow, and we haven't cleared a song. Yeah. Maybe we should clear a song. <laughs> no, it's often, it's often uh, down, to, down the to the wire. Yeah. 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 No, sometimes, uh, we, we do have the benefit, you know, with some of our songs, um, of working with songwriters to write specifically two scenarios that we know are gonna happen. We have a few songwriter kind of summer camp sort of days where we get together and, I mean, you can speak more to that, Tim. Yeah, well, there, we've had a couple writing camps where Marshall and Ed have come and kind of let people in in the general direction. I mean, I, when people talk to me, I say, look, you can, you can never go wrong if you pick one of these categories. Falling out of love, <laughs> falling in love, missing someone, and man, isn't it a great day. You know, one, one of those is probably going to eventually work for an episode. Yeah. So. Exactly. Although I feel like we don't get enough of, man, isn't it a great day on Nashville. <laughs> well, I mean, Avery kind of did it. He's, he's sort of been our... Sprinkled it. The script says, and Avery rocks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's sort <laughs> of <over. laughs> I love the... Uh, I love the one epi the example in this episode with Scarlett and Gunner. Um, there's a lot of layered subtext going on between them in that moment. And I think in the performance, you can see... Yeah their performances exactly. playing out under the music. In she a way rolled her eyes at one of his lines. <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. The, looks, they, the looks they give each other yeah. Yeah. Really good. And even Deegan can tell backstage watching yeah, them. Like, like, oh, this, is, this is not good. But I mean, that's fun because that's one of those things where I feel like the show has done that a lot, where you're playing on, if you're a real country music fan, there are some relationships like that that have, you know, I don't want to mention any names because they're not yeah. together anymore. But that like these situations have happened and they've had to go out and play. Yeah. And so it adds that extra level of sort of on to the show if you're right. really into the music scene. Right. And speaking of which, did you guys watch the CMT Awards last night and see your gang? <laughs> Chip yes. up there doing his thing. Yeah. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about the switch um, from ABC because really, I feel like the fans did that, right? Don't you feel like the fans got them to move that from ABC to CMT? I mean, for you all to join on? No, and it feels like the absolute perfect home. It feels like this is where Nashville should be and should have been. It's like, I don't know of like a network that matches a show so well, CMT in Nashville. It's like, you can't get really much better than that. And, you, and they give you so much. I mean, they, I mean, I'm assuming they help with getting Ray Lynn and Daniel Bradbury and Pam Tillis for goodness yeah, sake. Yeah, exactly. With like this, with this episode, I worked directly with, um, her name's Jackie at CMT and we went through names and Cassidy and Michael and Ray Lynn were also excited. It's cool when you see these people that, oh my God, I would love to be on it. It's so like, it's cool. And then it, there's so There's great. a label partnership too with Big Machine yeah. that, that does the soundtracks and that's something you can just go to and they'll say, great, this person's available, yeah. this person's available. Yeah. Well, why hasn't Taylor Swift been on the show? Ask Scott <laughs> Borchetta about that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have some good cameos coming up too. Uh, yeah. Uh, Casey Musgraves, yeah. other people. Yeah. Um, Ray, and you mentioned Margot so. Price. Is she somebody that we're actually going to see? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. Like, I love Margot Price. We'll, we'll look into <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> season right. six. Yeah. Work on that. And there is going to be a season six, correct? Yes. Yay! <laughs> 
season, yeah, it's been announced, yeah. So I want to ask, because some of the themes, too, in the last few episodes actually apply to you guys, too. I mean, even in just that last scene about talking about change and being on your way and accepting who you are, I mean, some of that is true for you all, too. You're saying goodbye to old characters, but Bucky, I mean, so soon after Raina, was that necessary? <laughs> we, that's not the last we'll see of Bucky. We love Bucky. We really do. Zach's just trying too. to make some changes that he thinks are positive. I don't know about Zach now. I mean, I great know. actor, well, yeah. good part, he's and great. very realistic we, to yeah. like. We like to keep you guessing about him, and, and, and you know, he's, he's not a pure villain. He's a, he's a complicated character, and I think that'll keep evolving as well. Yeah. But you have this opportunity, just like they do. You're going to infuse the show with new life. Rachel Belson is joining the show, among yep. other yes. people. And yay, Rachel yeah. Belson. Heart of Dixie. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I feel like I don't know anything about her character, and I feel like you should tell me about it. <laughs> her character, she, Zach brings her in. She's a Silicon Valley native. Or actually, she's from Seattle, but she's lived in Silicon Valley. Brack, Zach brings her in as a new CSO, Chief Strategy Officer for Highway 65. And she brings new ideas to the label that maybe not everybody likes, or maybe, and some do and maybe that will create problems. Right. So Zach likes them is what you're saying. Zach likes them. <laughs> and nobody else does. She, she, probably, uh, she probably knows almost nothing about country. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she may or may not go to a karaoke bar. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. We called that earlier today, so I'm guessing that Rachel is not singing. We, uh, no I mean, comment. professionally, professionally. She, she is, is not a singer on the show. Okay. She's not, she not a singer professionally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I mean, She's it great. She's really great. It'd be exciting for you all to have this opportunity to come in and take over something that I'm hoping that you all were fans of before you started working on it. Be honest. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jeff worked on the show already. Uh, there was a little bit of overlap, but also a lot of change going into this season. And uh, my uh, girlfriend at the time had been a huge fan, so I had dipped in and out of the previous 88 episodes. And then Scott really did the did some homework and watched all of them in a very short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually and played geez. I actually played a music before a scene was ever shot, too, I think. Yeah. I played in some of the stuff with T Bone before they ever shot a scene. Oh yeah, and Tim Tim has been a musician on since, since, the, pilot. since the pilot. Yeah. Um he's probably been a musician before then. Too. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Tim yeah, has I've been really practicing <laughs> <laughs> Before he was the producer for all of the music on our show, he was a musician on many of the tracks. And, and so how is that taking over for Buddy and T-Bone? I mean, that's well, some big shoes imagine. to Imagine. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're heroes of mine. Um, my, you know, when I had my... I was doing another show for Lionsgate called um, Greenleaf on the OWN Network, and all, all Black Gospel, and which, which I love and, and actually, believe it or not, did, have done a lot of and loved since I was real young, and I just kind of wanted to keep playing for Buddy. I was like, I don't know, I don't want anything to change. I want to go to Buddy's sessions and I want to do the other show. It's perfect. I don't want anything to change, and and it just kind of came down down the the pike. And in my interview with Marshall and Ed, I wasn't really desperate f for the job because I kind of didn't want anything. I didn't want Buddy to go. I still believe Buddy was going to stick around. Uh, so from the very beginning, I said, I'm not Buddy. And I'm not T-Bone. And part of my, my goal has, is I told them I don't have a brand. I don't have a sound. I come from a session background. So my brand is what do you want? So it's been really exciting for me to try to bring as many different sounds, use a wide variety of musicians, and try to bring in. We have actual, real live black gospel, programmed pop, um, Americana, radio kind of country stuff and I think a broader way than we've seen before. That was a goal for us creatively as well, because you know, we, we all love country music. I've come to love it even more from working on the show, but Nashville as a city has become increasingly diverse in every way, especially musically, um, all the genres that Tim just alluded to, and I think we felt that there was room on the show to explore the way that the city is musically diversifying in that way. And then you went out and got Rihanna Giddens to be on your show. Which, I mean... <laughs> It's crazy, and I, and I just got a mix back. And she's they, you know, I don't know how much we can say, but but she later sings a song out of her genre. She sings 
a pop song. She says, I don't know how to do this. And I said, look, you are a deep, deep musician. You have to channel your inner Beyonce and play. <laughs> you, have to be an, you have to be an actress right now. You have to act. You have to sing like you're playing a character that you are not. And she was very worried about it, and she absolutely nails it. And I sent it to her last night, and I said, hey, if this Americana darling doesn't work out, you... you well, you yeah, she's... I mean, I, I had no doubt she'd probably be able to do that because she has a classical background. She does this Americana. Um, I found her music with the Carolina Chocolate Drops when we were just doing some research, in a way, about music and sent a video or two to Marshall and just in a way of sort of showing a musical style that we could use... And he said, we just need her. And he yeah. just, he knew immediately that he wanted her on the show and she had never acted, but she's done great. And yeah, without giving too much away, uh, she will explore a career uh, of her own. Well, I'm just so excited that means she's still gonna be on the show because I wasn't sure if, if this was the end of this storyline that meant that she was gone. You know, the Carolina Chocolate Drops used to do a great, uh, cover of Blue Cantrell's Hit Em Up Style. If you've yeah. never seen it, yeah, well, the, Nash it the Nashville chocolate drops <laughs> up here. <laughs> they do the they Fuji's do. as well, a good cover of them. Yeah. Yeah. So things to look forward to. Yes. And also in that storyline, I thought was kind of brave one for the show to do because in the sense that the, the choir was critical of Juliet, some people have been critical of the show. And so, the fact that you are continuing with this and continuing with that character, I mean, I'm assuming that isn't a response to criticism. It's something that organically happens, but it's a, sort of a nice coincidence. I, I think that when you do a storyline that would provoke controversy or something in different, people might have different opinions. I, I think it is best to lean into what those different opinions might be and not try to hide from the fact that, uh, you know, some people might um, take offense or something like that, but rather explore it. And I think we, we always knew we wanted to kind of uh, be as nuanced and complicated with it and, and, and air the critiques ourselves as opposed to just waiting for people to throw them at us. <laughs> That's smart thinking. And so before we throw it uh, out to the audience, Jesse, I just wanted to ask you, was it preordained that this was what you were going to do because of your parents? That like, was there ever a this show? You mean no, this job, <laughs> this life. I mean, because uh, your mom is Liberty Gottschall, yes. right? Who all has also written episodes for the show. She His wrote episode ten, which was lovely. Is Edswick, yeah. who with Marshall Hershkowitz produces the show and produced so many great shows many in the past thirty something. Uh, um, but w were you always interested in this? Was this because yes you've and done no. other work? Yes and no. Uh, I. Uh, I was always interested in this, but I always actually thought I was going to do something totally different. What was that something? I worked in journalism for five years. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I worked in Washington D.C. Uh, at a couple of places, um, including the New Republic magazine. Wow. Uh, and um, you might, if you know that story at all of recent years, see some parallels in the uh, the Zach uh, character. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a billionaire comes in and tries to change things and yeah, not so, everybody likes it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I drew on that experience a little and it's only been in the last five years that I've been uh, had to admit to myself that this is something I'm very interested in doing. And I bet it pays better. It, there's some perks. There's some, there's, you get more free lunches and uh, trips to Austin. And, uh, yeah. Though you got to come here too. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> All right, I believe it's time for us to chat with the audience, yes? Cool. So does somebody have a microphone that runs around or do I just point at people and they stand up and yell? All right, somebody raise your hand and I'll point at you and you can stand up and yell. Right you, hello. <laughs> uh, so much has been said obviously about the national and social media and I'm wondering how much does that inform you guys in terms of storyline? Do you, is it does it influence you at all? I mean, I know probably the production cycle is a little bit off, but I'm curious to know how much that is. Yeah, we, I mean, a lot of the stories, by the time we see the responses, a lot of the stories are already, are already broken, and we stay true to those, but we definitely listen and definitely see and definitely understand sometimes where people are coming from and try to... It doesn't change too much, but we, we, we listen. We know, we know about it. <laughs> that, Does that answer your question? I, I think um, it definitely makes it into the, the, the conversation in the room. Uh, we, we, it, it, it definitely makes it into the room where we all work and, and we, we talk about the fans and their responses for sure. And it, it's an interesting thing, something like Twitter, where you, you know, we see it for sure. And it's important to pay attention to that and to honor these, especially the fans who are very vocal on Twitter. But 
it's also sometimes important to realize that sometimes it's about you know, 20 to 30 really incredibly diehard fans that we want to love and uh, appease, but there's also a million people who are not tweeting at us, so <laughs> sometimes it's, you're capable of, you don't want to lose perspective entirely and think that the whole world is yelling at you to do something or something like that. It's just your timeline. Who else got questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sometimes the quirkiest little details, like wedding rings and stuff. Well, people people notice things that sometimes we don't even notice. Um, but uh, I think in the in the obvious instance of of Raina's death, I mean, the amount of people who tweeted at me that they would never watch the show again, uh, and then told me a week later that they were crying their eyes out. It, it was, uh, it, we were very pleasantly surprised that people kept tuning in. It was scary, um, and we were very lucky that I think those episodes were really excellent, and people wanted to see what life would be like for everyone else. They, they, had, they Despite themselves, they'd fallen in love with everyone else on the show, and we we're just happy it went that way. Can I, uh, this is the, about the rain. The, uh, they said, you know, the girls and, and Deacon sing Life That's Good at the, the bedside. So there's the question, First of all, I thought that was a terrible idea. That was a very good idea. That was my idea. I can't even remember this what was song. Je Jeff wrote episode I don't even nine, want to so think about what song him. I thought, but I thought, oh no, that's, and then it's absolutely perfect. Anyway, so I went to the rehearsal and then I, I went out there and I could not, I mean, there were literally like huge trash cans full of used tissues and there were I'm kidding you not there were there were boxes and every every single person was crying and you know and out and when there was a moment and you see when I saw it yesterday the next day in the dailies I cried again because uh, 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 Maisie when her reaction when her mom dies just k killed me it was so great She's and they were all so sad about losing Connie and and they have grown up with her essentially yeah. as their mom and we had a rehearsal, I remember, with Callie, and Callie was so sensitive to them, and we went into a room, just Callie and me and the two girls. I don't think you were there yet, um, uh, very initially. Callie directed just, that episode, and Jeff wrote it, number nine, yeah. And just to talk about like what that moment was gonna be and what the song was, and, and uh, just in talking about it, the girls were a mess, could not even talk about it. So that whole episode for everyone, I think, was just an emotional train wreck, you know, and really hard to get. Yeah, through. and very now, authentic. You know? And and Connie, her last vocal, she was she was she cried, and it was it was everybody was really yeah. really sad. Yeah. It was you killed the main character on your show. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was sad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is yeah. this is why we made Jeff write it and Callie direct it because we were like they they had been with her for longer and right. yeah. But I mean, it really was remarkable from a performance standpoint. And I had to, I watched it again before I came here. And again, like on second viewing, just total waterworks, so good. And Con when I talked to Connie about it, we did an interview the other day. She just was so impressed with everyone too. I mean, it was just so lovely. Um, there was a lady in red who got right there. Um, how closely does the fictionalized process of songwriting match with like I think in any TV show, everything is really condensed, not just the music, but all, all action. So, uh, you know, one thing that I, uh, what episode did they show the montage of them writing the song together? Was that seven, 10 seven, or, seven, seven. was it? Oh. Yeah, with the hurricane. Yeah, yeah, the hur that to me, and my, my wife is a songwriter, we've written together, we've been married almost 25 years and been writing since before we were married. And we looked at each other and we thought, that is pretty dang realistic. That, that really nailed it of like, I've got this idea and I'm afraid to say it and is this gonna be weird and then how about this? And I think it's, for the most part, been, been, been pretty on. It happens quickly and you know, what, all, all the songs are great and they all work, which isn't always true, but it's pretty realistic. What, what astounded me is you'll have a co-write session and what is that generally, like an hour, two hours? At, at uh, Frankie's house, when we did that thing, we, you know, we wrote, we, we got together, we wrote uh, all of me, uh, I wrote with Lindy, do you guys, that was, that's our aired, yeah, that's a, and we wrote that in like 45 minutes, 45, you know, yeah, and then we just, yeah. Yeah, the, these, um, they, they write some of these songs faster than we write the episodes, I'll tell you that. I mean, I, I mean sometimes it, it obviously varies, and as you said, we condense a lot of the creative process occasionally, but 
I was so surprised by the amount of great songs that came out of a couple hours of the, one of those writers camps or something like that. It's a, it's a remarkable process. Um, I would also say that when, when um, the parameters help make it go quicker. So if you just, hey, let's get together and write a song. What should we write about? I don't know. Boo. But when you have somebody say, here's the scenario. These people are this, this, you can't say this, you can't say this, we need the golden hair, we need the this and the this, and it's like, okay. I, I and would say also that we... It's like when we did the Good Man song. It was so easy, because it's like we had this really detailed brief, and it's <laughs> great, we know what to do. I would say we also have a lot of musical consultants on the show who do, you know, who are there on set and are telling us exactly how it would go and where the mic would be and how the, all the people who play music on the show are real musicians. They're the real people who play the songs that you hear. And you're not even allowed to touch an instrument, basically, if you're not a musician on the show. So we take could, pictures yeah. of all the guitars, and so the guitars you hear are the ones you see, and it's you know. It's yeah, so we, we we try our best for sure. Tim, actually, that makes me think of something that is is happening right now and has been happening for a few years. There's a big knock on Nashville, the actual city, about sort of that co-writing thing, which is as old as the hills. I mean, that's mm -hmm. always been happening. But there's this idea that what is being made now in on Music Row in those sessions is somehow more manufactured than, you know, somebody who did that for Johnny Cash 50 years ago. It is more process. manufactured than somebody who did it for Johnny Cash 50 years ago. <laughs> they're, they're right. I, mean, I, the, I would agree with them. But the thing that the, what am I trying to say? The essence of the song. Like, do you feel like what you're doing when you write a song for the show that you love and you think is a good song, not that you're something that you're writing that's supposed to be sort of commercial and a sellout and whatever, but that you hope is actually creatively great is different than two people sitting down 50 years ago and writing a song. Well, uh, y yes. I think that this show offers, uh, uh, for people that don't love What's on Country Radio, this offers an alternative. And for people that uh, like What's on Country Radio, this offers an additional. So I think that the show fills uh, like, my parents don't listen to country radio, but they love the songs in the show. They have from the beginning, not just because I've been a part of it. And then there are country music fans that say, boy, we, these songs are a little, you know, more emotionally based and not quite as punchy in the face. With the, and they, we, I like having those, too. You know, so I, I think it, and especially now on CMT, it kind of expands. I loved seeing last night, you know, Deacon and, and, and um, Keith Urban, you know, and it kind of glues that together. And so... If you think about it, the songs on the show, most of them would never get on country yeah. radio. Oh, absolutely. Country radio and so being we, a different thing than the song. So we acknowledge, right. Show. And so, for instance, this, for me, when, when I hear the song, if once you have a, a person's name, once there's any action, once there's any location, once there's any object, it's out. If you listen to the radio, it's full of names, objects, places, action. My thing is it's in the script, it's on the page, and we have visuals. So we don't need any of that. So it's a completely different song. I think there's an interesting parallel also with the songwriting process you're talking about and TV writing also as a profession in that it, there is like a workman-like quality to it where you're, you, you're turning things out on a much tighter schedule. Um, but as Tim said, the, the constraints can, can, can bear you know, really interesting and beautiful fruit or something where uh, it's it sometimes you're, you're writing fast as a TV writer too, but um, you have the rewarding part of seeing it suddenly be shot and suddenly be a screened in a way that's lovely and and sometimes yeah within the constraints the same way when you're writing a sonnet and you have a rhyme structure or whatever um it can provoke creativity as well yeah and you also have to hit certain beats it's the the, the boundaries can be the same who else has got a question as we get mired down in songwriting conversation right there go ahead um i noticed an interesting moment uh in this episode where um maddie and Peter are coming in and you see maddie sort of shift a little bit which Talking to Stephen about Bucky and you know, and then when Maddie or when Sterling Daphne comes in, she sort of, you know, Deacon looks for her and she's doing that's weird. We're gonna see a little bit of Maddie sort of starting to take on the matriarch a little bit, like in in Raymond's absence. The matriarch, I mean, it's I think it's I think it's stay or for the most part Deacon Deacon's household, right? But I think Maddie steps, Maddie will fill some shoes. She's sure. coming of yeah. age, definitely. Yeah, I think a lot of it's about her, you know, she's, she's nearly 18 and she's, she's becoming, I mean, she's already emancipated on the show, but she's, she's becoming an adult. And I think you're going to see stories relating to that. And um, 
Yeah, there's and, uh, and who she is as an artist, you know, in the heel on in the heels of on the heels of her mother dying, and I am I am reminded of something that comes later, where yeah. there's something, there's things that Daphne goes through, or, or other things going on, and and you do see her stepping into a slightly more adult role in relation to her little sister, or other things. I mean, I'm reminded of my own. I don't know. I have a sister who's seven years younger, and there was an awkward period of time. Like now, we're very close, and we we consider each other as as best friends and peers, but when I was that age and she was 12, you know, it was a different relationship. So uh, I think there's some of that. Yeah. All right, who else? I can't really see. Who's got a, oh, right back there. I see you, glasses. Yes, that's you. I love the introduction of Juliet's father in this episode and the flashbacks. Yes. What was the thought process in why now? And are we going to learn more about that? This, it came, I, this, stemmed from season two, episode two, where Juliet takes actually, I think a CMT crew to her old trailer park. Um, and she tells a story about how they painted the house yellow and how her dad made her this thing right before he died. And this then came into this, putting Juliet in this spotlight now where she's back performing and what kind of obstacles she'd be overcoming. So I just wanted to think about what, she, where, what place she would go when Hallie, um, sorry, yeah, Hallie brings up that safe place what she would think of. And I just thought back to the trailer park and I thought we see the mom so much and we haven't really seen the father. So I thought why not show the father and the relationship that was there. The show has mined a lot of uh, backstories of previous parents and traumatic incidents. Yeah. And, and that was a, a, rare, a rare one that hadn't been. So it was also a little bit of process of elimination, but it was a yeah. hole in Juliet's story in a way that Scott sort of was able to find and flesh out and turn into something really beautiful. Yeah. Are we ever going to run out of like tra trauma for Juliet? I feel like never, <laughs> never. It's just going to no. keep getting worse. Who else has a question? I feel like I saw another hand up. You sir, right there. Uh, hey, Scott, uh, Scott Ryan. Hey, nice to meet you. We have uh, talked about thirty something. Thirty something. Yes, that's right. Uh, the book. You helped me a lot with the book. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great to meet you. We do have, no, no, we definitely have a writer's room. I think we meet as a big group uh, to, break, to break the season long stories. We'll meet as a big group, big group. but as often as other, some other shows do, when we get down to the episodic, when we sit and talk about specific episodes, it will be Marshall and to Marshall, Jesse, another writer, Marshall, Ed, another writer. It, we, we like when you get to the, spe the specifics of an episode to kind of make it smaller, but we all sit for sure and gather. Yeah, I'd say it's a sort of hybrid format. I mean, they, as you mentioned, weren't used to the sort of now more de rigueur process of having like 12 people in a room, like breaking out all the beats of a story. That was never their process. Um, this one's a bit of a hybrid where, yeah, we all get together, we work, talk about the big stories, but I think they still really believe strongly in, in, in when, when the story is handed off to a writer, it not being so uh, nailed down beat by beat to give the writer a little bit of freedom and ownership over what that episode's going to be in a way that I think is different than uh, some other drama television shows. Oh. Me too. <laughs> Good answer. I feel like there was a question right behind you a second. Yes, right there, man. Are there any kinds of storylines that you feel like you've been able to do on CMT that you should not do on network? I think, um, in general, we've been able to, with CMT, slow down the stories a little bit, let them breathe um, a lot more, which has been really nice. Um, I think we may have, in the old days, um, on network television, shied away from uh, the religion story, for example, with Juliet. I think that's a little bit, you know, for network television, it's a little harder to tackle. Um, there are a few controversial, interesting, provocative stories to come, too, that, um, I mean, all I can say is that CMT has been really great at giving us the creative freedom to explore these things, and I wasn't on ABC, but I, I think in general there's a little bit more of an emphasis on letting us do our thing and explore these things um, compared to, say, a traditional way a network tries to kind of drown you in notes. <laughs> ABC had some uh, 
regular policies about, you know, like, when somebody enters the room, you play them in. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> and then when they shut the door, boo -do -do -do, you know? And so, <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been, but you know, you know what I mean when I hum this, you know, like, oh, that. So that's loosened up. Like the Seinfeld music, basically. Yeah. It's what that's not like. All right, I feel like we have time for more, one more, right? And do I see a hand? I'll ask it if you don't. So if you've got it, now's your chance, right there. So the other new face coming to the show this season um, is Caitlin Doubleday, who happens to be from kind of the other major music genre on TV right now. Can you talk a little bit about whether that was an intended choice in kind of representing Empire as he comes to the show? Well, I, I didn't know her specifically from Empire, but you know we had a long process looking for someone to p play that role, and we actually auditioned and read a lot of people, and she was just someone that, that wanted in the room. She's just a really excellent actress, and um, we again had the freedom to really just pick the, the best person for it, and, and, and it was her. She proved it. Uh, yeah, and you'll see a lot more of her soon. <laughs> Oh, and before I let you go, I just wanted to ask about Trevor Noah as your choice of the person that she was going on late night with. <laughs> that, that, that was my episode. Uh, <laughs> that it was seemed a, like a really specific, odd choice. Uh, I wouldn't say that that was written from the first moment, but uh, we, we love integrating the show into real life, and, and we love... it's All of those scenes work so much better when we're able to get a real host of a television show to participate with us, and people have been really generous and, and interested in, in doing so, and Trevor just expressed interest in being a part of the show, and I think maybe doing more acting in general, and it was sort of just a win-win. He came down to Nashville for the day, and it was really fun. Even though you were supposed to be in New York at his set? Yeah, he, they shot, no, they shot something up there, York. but then they shot so, something with him in a green room down in Nashville, so we did shoot on their sets. Yeah. And then he also came down to Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to picture him as a country music fan, but anything is possible. Because he was like, and he was making her sing in a way that seemed sort of un Trevor Noah like. She doesn't want to sing. Leave her alone. <laughs> but good get for the show. And I feel like since you've got Harry now for Harry's show, maybe you need to get Harry on as Harry. Yeah, we should get him to sing or something. I don't know. All right, that's the plan. Well, I want to thank you all so much for coming. And I want to thank you all so much for coming and being a part of us. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.